Happy Wednesday, everyone. My name is Yiling Zhuang. I'm the Water Resources Regional Specialized Agent in University of Florida IFAS Extension. Welcome to the Water Wednesday. Water Wednesday is a webinar series about Florida's precious resource, water. Every Wednesday afternoon at two o'clock Eastern time, we will live stream a 30 minute talk about Florida's water and what we can do to protect it. We host our webinar series on Zoom and broadcast to Facebook Live. We have attendees joining us all over the world. Please put in the chat box and tell us where you are watching this webinar. If you are viewing our webinar on Facebook, please be aware of scammers. This webinar series is free. Please do not click any links that are not posted by the admin. We have a theme for every month. This month, we focus on clean water. Last Wednesday, we briefly reviewed the water policies and the regulations in Florida. I will post a link of our recap blog if you missed the webinar. This Wednesday, we will switch the gear and learn the power of pounds. Our guest speaker for today is Ms. Uh, Tina McIntyre, the Florida Friendly Landscape Agent in Seminole County. Now let's welcome Tina. Thank you, Yilin. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tina McIntyre, Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent at the University of Florida IFAS Extension in Seminole County. And I'm really excited to teach you today about the power of your pond. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start screen sharing. Yilin, can you see? Yes, I can see it. Okay, excellent. And thank you to all of you joining us from uh, Zoom and Facebook. So we will get started. Great. So today we're going to talk about ponds, and this could be a stormwater pond, a retention, detention, wet retention, dry detention. It could be a lake. It could be a small pond, a natural pond, a sinkhole. Um, it really could be any type of water body. And so we're going to kind of talk about how these ponds really have so much power behind them to keep our drinking water safe. So like I mentioned, I'm with the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, and this is a statewide program here in Florida that operates through the UF IFAS Extension in partnership with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. And we use these nine guiding Florida friendly principles to kind of connect landscaping to water quality and water quantity, uh, protecting our aquifer, protecting our many lakes, rivers, and streams. And so just to run through briefly, we have right plant, right place is number one. So we wanna start off by putting the right plant in the right place. And today I'm excited to share with you a few aquatic species that'll be suitable for your landscape. Watering efficiently, making sure that we use the water from our aquifer properly on our landscapes and we don't overwater. Fertilizing appropriately, fertilizers contain nutrients that can become pollution if they're not properly applied to the landscape. And so we wanna make sure we're always following the label and um, fertilizing appropriately. Mulch is also important in your landscape. When you're using it in an aquatic environment, you wanna be careful um, about the slope of your uh, bank of your pond because the mulch could you know, kind of flow into the pond. But in most landscapes, mulch is really encouraged and it helps to increase the organic material of your soil, which is really important for plant health. Attracting wildlife, lake shores and ponds are a great place to provide water for wildlife. And vegetating those shorelines, um, like we'll talk about today, is a great way to attract wildlife, pollinators, all kinds of great uh, wildlife to your landscape. Managing yard pests responsibly, number six. 
So we don't want to do any routine pesticide application in our landscapes, especially around water bodies. We want to make sure that we're applying pesticides only as needed and trying to utilize biological controls and other methods prior to using chemicals. Number seven, recycling yard waste. So this could be composting or even just simply utilizing leaves in your landscape as mulch and raking them up into, I know here in Florida, we have so many leaves dropping right now. So using those in the landscape. Reducing stormwater runoff, we'll talk a lot about that today, but essentially no matter where you're joining us from on the planet today, we have we all live in a watershed. Now that watershed might be um, similar to what we have here in Seminole County, it's very flat. We have a watershed that runs into our Wakaiva River, or if you're in a mountainous area of the country or the planet, then you might have a different type of watershed. But really we wanna um, acknowledge that we're in a watershed and that whatever we do does impact downward water, so downstream water. And then number nine, what we're talking all about today is protecting that waterfront, making sure that we're um, dealing with it properly and really vegetating those shorelines. So a little bit more about that principle number eight, watershed and nutrients. So everybody lives in a watershed and when it rains, the rain and the water, the storm water as we call it, picks up debris, nutrients, pollution, all kinds of stuff throughout the landscape. So in an urban area like picture here um, with the homes, it could be an, a suburban neighborhood or could be a very urbanized area with industry, that is gonna pick up various things and carry it all to the river. And ultimately that river discharges to the ocean. And so we're all um, living in some type of watershed. You can see here in the watershed, we have a natural environment where the water is gonna percolate down into the aquifer. Or here um, we have the cattle and the farming. And so that's a different type of watershed that would have different type of inputs. So you can see listed here, we have nutrients, lawn fertilizers, grass clippings and leaves. Like I said, debris and trash can become part of that stormwater pollution, manure and pet waste and sediment from erosion. So if you have an area by your pond or in your neighborhood that has a lot of washing out, definitely be careful to try to vegetate that area to prevent erosion. So again, just to kind of drive this point home that we all live in a watershed. So even if you don't have a pond really close to you on the edge of your property, we all have the ability to positively or negatively impact our water bodies. And so it rains, irrigation, or even, you know, rain or irrigation, pick up these pollutants. They carry the yard debris and everything into the storm drains. And those connect to either a stormwater pond or directly to our lakes. And that then will percolate down into the aquifer. So it's all connected. And here's how the eutrophication process can happen. So if we have too many nutrients in that stormwater, so from pet waste or fertilizers from agriculture or residents, we have excessive algae and weed growth. And so that nutrients, instead of feeding our crops or our grass, is actually feeding the aquatic vegetation. And this is really important when we tie it into lakes because, you know, when we think of a lake system that's in balance, we don't want to see a ton of algae, you know, really overly vegetated. Um, it is natural for systems to have algae and aquatic vegetation, but too much might indicate an excessive nutrient issue. And when we have excessive algae or excessive vegetation, we can then have habitat degradation, a decrease in water quality, and ultimately fish kills. So all the oxygen or all the lakes and, and streams have oxygen in them. And so just like fish use their gills to breathe that oxygen, um, it actually, the oxygen level in those ponds change as there is a different in the nutrient cycle. And so ultimately, if the oxygen levels are imbalanced, then we can have fish kills. And we've had those occur right here in the state of Florida. 
and ultimately a loss of recreation. You know, we have a lot of beautiful springs and rivers here. We want to get out and paddle and kayak and canoe. And when we have a reduction in water quality or fish kills, you know, it does inhibit the recreational capacity. So this is a, basically a simplified nutrient enrichment conceptual model, a fancy way of saying, you know, when we have those nutrients running through our watershed into our streams, these are the kind of problems. And it's very site specific. So, you know, your pond, again, might be surrounded by agriculture, or maybe it's surrounded by suburban homes, or maybe it's highly urbanized and um, you know, you're really not even sure where the local water body is. You know, so it is highly dependent on what's in that watershed. And um, you know, if it, there's a lot of septic tanks or things like that, that can also factor in. So here's an example of an impaired stormwater pond. And impaired stormwater ponds, you know, they do have excess nutrients and they have an increase of algae. So this one in particular is, is having an algae bloom rather than so others might have, you know, a very, very dense vegetation. So what we want to do is focus on our fertilizer use and make sure that we're, um, you know, really following that Florida friendly principle of fertilizing appropriately and just some best management practices to consider is to never fertilize within 24 hours of a rain event. And this is really important around our lakes, our rivers and streams, or even you know culverts and drains. Because when we fertilize and we have a heavy rain come, like we do get here in Florida during our tropical um, rainy season in the summer, that can actually wash right into our waterways. We don't wanna use any phosphorus fertilizer without a soil test. So starting off to see if your soil actually has phosphorus in there and then seeing if you need phosphorus. So phosphorus is important to plants for their blooming and fruiting. However, we do want to make sure that we're not using it improperly because it can become pollution in our waterways. We also want to select a slow release fertilizer. So using at least 65% slow release. If you can't find a 60%, 65%, you can use a 50% slow release and that's perfectly acceptable as well. June through September 1st. So this is particular to our county here in Seminole County, but really if you have a summer rainy season, um, you wanna avoid that summertime application of nitrogen and phosphorus. And so you can see here in the calendar, I've blocked out that June through September. So in our county, per county law, we can't actually use those nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers during that period. However, um, it does differ throughout the state and you know, the country. So you might wanna check your local ordinance to see what the, what the situation is in that way. Now, as far as University of Florida, in Central and North Florida, we don't recommend fertilizing in November, December, January, and February in the cold season months, or at least while the, the grass is not actively growing. So, uh, you know, if we use fertilizer during those months, it typically is not going to get taken up by those roots because they're not actively growing because we see a more dormant period. So we don't want to be fertilizing during that time. And again, you know, improper fertilization can lead to our water body impairment. So that can really help keep your pond happy and healthy. Um, some more best management practices for fertilizer include no fertilizing within 15 feet of the water body. Now this does vary for the laws throughout the state of Florida. In Seminole County, it is 15 feet. In other counties, it might be as little as three feet. So check your local area. However, if you reduce that fertilizer, you know, you're gonna see less input into that waterway. So it is a best management practice. And then what we also recommend is a 10 foot or more low maintenance zone. And this zone, uh, we recommend just vegetating. And 
This is really a powerful thing to do. And we're, we're mimicking the natural ecosystem and the environment. So this low maintenance zone is where we're not gonna be mowing, we're not gonna be using pesticides or herbicides, and we're gonna use aquatic vegetation to um, kind of vegetate that area. And you can curate it as a landscape design, you can um, you know, get fancy with it, or you can simply just stop mowing and let that vegetation move in. Now, as if you do select that option, you wanna be sure to monitor for any invasive species because they are very opportunistic and we don't wanna have them moving in uh, to vegetate that area. So we do wanna make sure they're native plants. And of course our UFIFAS extension Master Gardener help desk is always available for you to send us some pictures and say, hey, what is this plant moving into my shoreline? Is it good, is it bad? And we're happy to help you with that. So we're, we're vegetating the shoreline either in a curated manicured way, or we're doing it in a way that is, um, you know, just a natural, letting the natural vegetation take over. And we want to do that in a way as well that acknowledges the bank shelf and the bank slope, the stability. So if we have a really hard, um, say, you know, box shape to our pond, we're not going to have a lot of easy vegetation establishment. So when we have a pond that has a really nice gentle littoral, we call it littoral zone shelf, that's going to have a nice slope and roots can grow in and things will be able to establish. So that might be something you can work with and maybe something that's a little bit harder to work with. Um, you know, it just case by case, it's just something to keep in mind that will help you establish those plants. So for our stormwater ponds, you know, again, the slope of the shoreline influences the runoff, erosion, and plantings. And again, they also tend to get their water from these drains, culverts, also, another word is called weir, a weir, and we want to make sure that those drains, those culverts, and our weirs are clear and clean of debris, um, at least for these stormwater ponds. A natural lake may or may not, depending on the age of the development around the pond, may or may not have culverts and drains. But it really is quite critical to make sure, especially this time of year when we're getting a flurry of leaves and debris coming down from our trees, from our oak trees and otherwise, to make sure that we clean those out or call your homeowners association um, or you know, get with your neighborhood, your city, municipality to make sure that those drains are remaining clear. And this is important for the health of the pond because that debris actually becomes nutrients in the lake. Again, feeding that cycle of algae and vegetation. And of course, for those of us living here in Florida, it's also important as hurricane season is right around the corner. So we wanna make sure that we're keeping those free and clear. Now, again, if you do have a slope that is steep and it's difficult to work with, just do the best you can with bank stabilization. We want to make sure that that bank, what we call the side of the lake or the side of the pond, has a nice, sturdy, stabilized um, flow zone here. So you can do that with sandbags if you have them, riprap, we call it here with this um, kind of rocks basically. So in the industry, we call that riprap to be able to kind of bolster or um, enhance and maintain that shoreline. In some areas you might have a canal wall, a sea wall that keeps it, but the best option is really vegetating that area. So you can see here vegetation along those ponds, even if you can just get a little bit established, that's gonna help prevent erosion and long-term stability for the area. Another option is to utilize a berm and swale, or swale and berm, however you like to say it, but essentially it is a cutout and a, a dig out close to the lake, close to the pond, that allows the water to flow in and percolate down. And so here on my diagram, you can see maybe a little house here, and as the, the, the topography eases down into the lake, there's a cutout and a dip and then it rises up with the tree, that's the berm. So the swale is actually the dip and the cutout, 
and the berm is where you have that tree. And essentially, as this water flushes off the house, it's going to rest for a little bit before it goes and flushes into the lake. And this swale and berm helps things to percolate. It helps the water to slow down as it rushes into the lake so that you're preventing erosion. So if you have bad erosion problems, if you can put in a, a swale and berm, you do need the space, of course, you know, so in urban areas, this can be a little bit difficult. But if you have the space, you can consider putting in a, a berm and swale. And this is going to help collect that stormwater runoff. Um, you can even in some instances, run all of your gutters into that area and create a little rain garden, maybe plant some aquatic vegetation uh, that eases again that transition into the lake shore. So let's talk more about plants and what would work to vegetate our shoreline. So again, a vegetated shoreline is going to help control that erosion. And erosion is really bad for our ponds, not only because those particulates inhibit the critters that live in the lake. So like our damselfly larva, dragonfly larva, uh, any kind of aquatic invertebrate or fish really is going to have issues with particulates in the lake. But additionally, here in Florida, we have a lot of high phosphorus soils. And so as that soil is washed into the, the water and aquatic environment, we do see an increase in that phosphorus pollutant as well. So erosion can be doubly a problem. And so we want to utilize this vegetation, prevent that erosion. And another thing is we are providing habitat. Stormwater ponds, and if we look at all the stormwater ponds, not even including lakes or rivers, just man-made, man human-created stormwater ponds, uh, we're talking a large surface area for the state of Florida. We have you know, almost one in every neighborhood. Lots of commercial businesses have them. And if we were to utilize those ponds to create habitat, and even just for pollinators, it would greatly enhance the ecosystem services that are so integral to our agriculture and, um, and our society. They're also gonna reduce nutrients. So you can think about as, you know, say just behind this photo, there might be a suburban development. And if there is improper fertilization going on or maybe some pet poo that wasn't totally picked up one day, this vegetation is going to block that from entering into this waterway. It's going to absorb it. So it creates a physical and chemical barrier to the, the nutrients entering that waterway, a waterway. It also helps to reduce temperature. So not necessarily in this landscape, but um, you know, vegetation does regulate temperature. So especially when we think about things like shrubs and trees. And so it's just going to help to kind of regulate that. And it also will cre prevent those grass clippings from entering the waterway. So if we were to mow right up to this shoreline, we would have, you know, probably naturally some of those grass clippings spitting out into the pond. We want to make sure that we're, again, embracing that low maintenance zone so that we don't have the grass clippings flying into the water because we want to prevent them from entering. So starting off with right plant, right place, we want to select plants that are suitable for that area. We want to also select plants that require minimal water maintenance, fertilizer, and pesticides. Because when we're in such close proximity to the waterway, we can have that pollution, you know, enter so easily. So we want to look for plants that are really going to be low maintenance, um, not hungry feeders, we call them, not plants that are going to be really wanting a lot of nutrients. So we want to think about um, native versus non-native trees. We want to look for maybe wetland varieties of trees, that littoral zone. So this is just the fancy word that we use for the shoreline of the lake, that plants that are either submerged, and that would be literally they live in the water column. So things like, you know, our invasive hydrilla, that is a submerged species. It's fully in the water. You don't see any part of it really um, from, you know, the, the top of the water. 
Um, other things like our native bladder warts, utricular areas are great for submerged species. Emergent, that's going to be something that lives in that littoral shoreline zone, but it tends to have a part of the plant that is emerging out of the water. These are also going to provide erosion protection and again, that buffer, buffer zone and nutrient reduction. So again, I did mention a few times that invasive plant species. These are just a few of them that we really want to make sure that we are um, removing from our waterways. So you might see some alternanthera or alligator wort, uh, alligator weed, excuse me. We have um, water hyacinth is a really big problem in our waterways. And then torpedo grass. Torpedo grass is, is not a good one that you might be familiar with. So removing those invasive species and definitely getting with your municipality, your city, state, or even just the Fish and Wildlife Commission to make sure that they're giving you permission to remove those species and you don't want to remove too much or um, you know, too much of your shoreline without permission, you can get a fine. So definitely make sure that you're getting all those permits. And then once you have an area that you're looking to vegetate, these are the plants that we want to go and, and look for. So just a few ideas, and then I'll get into some in detail. But we have arrowhead, which is Sagittaria lancifolia. Um, we also have arrowroot, which is Thalia geniculata. Giant bulrush or Scurpus californicus, pickerel reed. This is a very common one in our central Florida area. Pontederia cordata, really beautiful purple flowers, and canna lily. This is another great one, canna flaccida. Um, if we're looking at trees, so bald and pond cypress are great selections for any water body. They would be fantastic along the side of a river or uh, even a stormwater pond. These are really hardy Florida native species and we want to select them to, again, help regulate the temperature, create habitat and a great environment. Acer rubrum, this is another Florida tree. It's called the red maple. And this is gonna have a little bit of that color change, which is really nice for anybody who wants to enhance their landscape in that way. They're extremely easy to germinate from seed. So if you're looking to save a few bucks, um, you know, you try your hand at germinating them from seed. And they're very fast growing. So unlike the bald cypress we just saw, the Acer rubrum or the red maple is gonna grow very rapidly and um, they, they get quite, quite big. Duck potato, Sagittaria lancifolia. So this one is not gonna get too big. This is not a tree, but it's really good at that bank stability. So you can see it here in the picture, it has a rhizome, which is a, basically a lateral root that's growing sideways. And it has lots and lots of roots coming off of that. And so as the plant grows, it's going to grow lad, lad, uh, longitudinally and be able to establish that shoreline with vegetation quite rapidly. So duck potato or Sagittaria lancifolia is another great one. I mentioned pickerel weed, so Pontederia cordata. You have these beautiful purple blooms, and these are great for butterflies and pollinators. Again, this is another one that will spread vertically and really help, um, or sorry, laterally, and really help to vegetate that area. Giant bulrush, Scurpus californicus. This one's going to be, again, not a tree, but it is going to be a little bit bigger than the, po the Pontederia. Uh, and the duck potato. They do have a dwarf version of this. It's uh, just regular bulrush. And so you want to consider, you know, this one might be a little too big if, you know, a lot of people are concerned about the lake view. If you're on a stormwater pond, this could be a good fit because a lot of people are interested in just kind of vegetating those stormwater ponds. Spartina bakeri. This is one of our lovely native Florida bunching grasses. So again, this one, since it's a bunching grass, it's not going to be spreading rhizomally or, you know, throughout the area, 
But if you plant a few of them together, like a nice set of 10 or 20, and just make a nice bunched area of all these different bunching grasses, it really will help to reinvigorate that bank stability, prevent erosion, and really a year round low maintenance plant. So no fertilizing. Once a year, you come in and give it a haircut and the rest of the year, it's a set it and forget it. So it's just getting it established. Once it's established, it's gonna do well. New far. So this is gonna be one of those emergent species that I mentioned. This is actually rooted in the bottom of the lake. So, you know, to plant them is a little tricky, but once you get it established, this is also known as cow lily. These cow lily um, pads are going to emerge from the water. And these make great habitat for our damselflies, dragonflies. Um, you know, again, these invertebrate insects are emerging from the water and becoming winged insects. And so these cow lily pads are perfect for them to kind of perch on um, and, and, you know, have their metamorphosis. And Nelumbo lutea. So this is a, another type of lily pad, American lotus here in Florida. If you've ever been to Payne's Prairie or some of the more natural areas up in North Florida, you'll see it blooming in, in the summertime and it's quite beautiful. So it's a great one to add to your landscape. They have really cool and unique pods. Again, this one would be rooted in the bottom of the lake. So something to consider. So, you know, with that, that is the power of these ponds is that, you know, they're protecting our water quality and quantity for future generations. The water that's in these ponds is going to be percolating down into our aquifer, which provides drinking water for our state. And again, you know, we have all these beautiful wildlife and recreation that we can really enjoy by protecting these ponds with that low maintenance zone and that fertilizer free 15 foot buffer area. And with that, I will pass it back over to Miss Yi Lin. I'm Tina McIntyre and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Tina. That was great. That was very informative. I saw a question at the chat box. I'm not very clear what it was referring to because the question is, is it legal to plant in that area or is it always designated a protected wetlands? Mm. That's a great question. So it really depends on, I think, yeah, this question's coming in from Miss Melissa. Hi, Melissa, that's a really good question. So essentially it varies. Um, you know, the lake shore is protected and it varies from county to county, from city to city. So what I recommend is that if you do have some invasive species or you're thinking about some landscape enhancements, uh, maybe adding some of the species we talked about today, call your local municipality and ask them what is required of you. Because in some, in some counties, they might require a permit no matter what. Other counties, they might say, well, you can do what you need to within 20 feet and you can have an area of 20 feet, maybe it's 30 feet. Um, you know, there's a lot of variation from county to county, city to city. So do call them and see what they recommend. And then, but typically they will allow you for an area that, you know, would have typically like a dock and would have maybe a small clearing and then some nice curated um, area. If you want to do the whole thing, they might have you submit a plan, like a landscape design. And um, that could be something very basic or it could be done by a professional, you know, but work with them and, you know, also work, check with your HOA, your homeowners association, if, if you have one to see if, you know, they have any rules or any specific, um, you know, questions. So when it comes down to the Florida friendly law, all residents are able to integrate Florida friendly into their landscape. So that could be by a shoreline or in the front yard or wherever, but we do have to obtain the proper permits and the proper approval from our homeowners association to be able to, to do so. Great, thank you, Tina. 
it took me a while to find my Facebook page. I was searching that, I lost my Facebook page. So I understand that there are about 10 seconds delay between Zoom and Facebook. So if you are viewing on the Facebook, please type your questions and we will get back to you. Um, now I'm checking our Zoom part. I don't see any questions pop up yet. I did see somebody wanted a link from last week's webinar. Yes, I, yes. Thank you, Tina. I post a link here. It's the last week's uh, uh, recap blog about Florida's water policies and the regulations. Uh, so if you missed uh, uh, our live webinar, you can go to that link and just to watch the recording. I also post all our record events on our YouTube channel, which I will also put in the chat box. Um, before everyone leaves, I like to oh, I already post a link here. So if you like our Word of Wednesday series, we will really appreciate if you can take the survey and tell us what you have learned and how we can improve this series. So you can find the link in the chat box. Um, meanwhile, let me check again on our Facebook page. I don't see any questions yet, but I did see we have attendees all over the world. So we have attendees from Asia and we have uh, um, Asia on our Facebook page and our zoo session, we see it's uh, around the States. So some yeah. North, I, I wonder how's the weather over there? Well, that's the thing with water and with ponds, you know, there's, seldom, you know, unless you live in a desert, um, you know, you're going to be looking for these best management practices. And a lot of the, the talk today was a focus on Florida species, but these principles and ideas can be extrapolated to any shoreline, you know, regardless of where we're talking about on the planet. It's always good to make sure that we protect our water um, by integrating these principles, which really replicate nature, replicate ecology. Well said, Tina. Great. I think it's a good point uh, just to introduce you our next week's Water Wednesday. As I said at the beginning, this month it's clean water. So next week we'll switch gear again. We'll switch from ponds to springs and we'll focus on Florida Springs. Just a little bit preview, believe it or not, Florida has the largest concentration of springs, not just in the nation, but also in the world. If you want to learn more about springs, so don't miss our next week's Water Wednesday. And with that, I appreciate your time attending this webinar. And thank you, Tina, for this informative talk. And see you all next Wednesday. Bye now. My pleasure. Thank you, Yilin. Thank you, everyone.